often, maybe every four or five years, we talk about what to do with your body because it's really a part of a good death. And it's a part that you have a big choice in. We're all gonna die. And then the question is, what do we want done then? And many people say, well, I'll just leave it to whoever and I don't have to make a choice about that. I'm making so many choices already. But actually it helps very much to know what your choices are and to make that choice ahead of time. Because if somebody else chooses for you, your wishes, which may have to do with saving the environment or helping other people with organ donation or uh, just uh, making sure that your body is taken care of the way you want it because your kids may think you want the million dollar funeral and you don't really want that at all. So it's very helpful to discuss that with them and put that, include that in your advanced directive. So we do have uh, some very excellent speakers today. Andrea Barnes said uh, the, she was appointed by the president of the San Diego Memorial Society in 2017 as the office director. And she said the president at the time thought she would be a terrific candidate for the job because she knew the working end of a Kleenex box when it came to grief after losing her son in 2013. I don't know if you want to tell us anything about that, Andrea, but, but do tell us about the San Diego Memorial Society and the uh, its host, the Funeral Consumers Alliance, or maybe I'm not putting that in the right way. Andrea, okay. Yes, okay. So um, we became part of the Funeral Consumers Alliance back in uh 1960 at the time uh we we did get started back in 1958 by a group of uh, individuals that were um, inspired by a minister at the unitarian universalist church who was um a little bewildered at some of the high costs of funerals that he saw the members of his church pain. And so he wrote for some information. He knew that there was two other groups already that had formed, one up in Seattle, the People's Memorial Society, and another organization in San Francisco. And so he wrote to them for information about how to start a society. And that's exactly what they did within a month of that um, talk that he gave to the church, they had already drafted the bylaws for the San Diego Memorial Society. And we've been going strong ever since. When they first got started, they used Humphrey Mortuary, which is in Chula Vista. It's now called the Funeraria del Angel. They're no longer one of our participating mortuaries, but they were up until 2007, at which point they were bought out by a, a big corporate entity called Dignity I, I want it's, it's dignity. I'll just leave it at dignity. Yeah, I don't know. I think there's a second word there. Dignity Memorial, right? They own a lot of, um, of uh, funeral homes all over the country. And Humphreys was bought out by them, but they still serviced all of our members who wanted to, you know, continue to have themselves on file with Humphrey Mortuary. But any of our new members nowadays that are joining, they have the choice of 11 different mortuaries. All of these mortuaries, we go out, we vet, we make sure they're in good standing with the community, with the Better Business Bureau. All of them are family owned. They're small um, mortuaries, normally in a strip mall, or they do have a physical presence. They're not just um, aggregators of, of the services that are needed, but they're actually there so that people can come in and you know, talk about what's happening, you know, they've lost a loved one. So they have that support from a funeral director and they're allowed with our program to choose from six different plans. And those different plans include everything from a simple cremation. The second one is a cremation with the scattering to see of the ashes an unwitnessed scattering. Uh, the third one is a simple burial. And the next two are a burial with a viewing like the old traditional funerals that basically we we grew up with and were sort of taught that was the normal way to have it uh, but the memorial society wanted to make sure people realized that there were alternatives to having that expensive funeral with the open casket and the um you know everything that goes along with that so we have six different plans 
you can uh, our people can choose any of those six plans and our mortuaries get to say what price they want to charge for that six plan so if you go to our website and you don't need to do it right now obviously but on our website uh, up in the top menu is uh, mortuaries and pricing and when you click on that you'll see our list of 11 mortuaries and then the different plans and what each one of those individual mortuaries is gonna charge a member. You're gonna save about $200 on a simple cremation, but you're gonna save, gosh, up to $1,200 to $2,000 on some of the, um, the other like plan four and plan five, which are the uh, more traditional funerals. And so, like I said, we've been around since 1958. I'm in the office every day, even on Saturdays. And I get a lot of calls from people who have just lost a loved one. They're getting ready to lose a loved one or they wanna plan ahead. Um, so as Faye was saying at the beginning, I lost my son back in 2013 to very unexpected circumstances. And uh, that going through that helped me understand what these people are going through when they call me uh, for some assistance. Andrea, um, mm -hmm. Memorial Society is a nonprofit, right? As is the yeah. Consumers Alliance. It, yes, it's a 501c4. So uh, we don't have the C3 status. And I don't remember exactly why. I think, I think it has to do with the fact that we charge for a membership. We do charge $55 for a membership. But if someone's really in need, we'll go ahead and give away a membership. So uh, we might be eligible for five uh, C three status, but we just haven't bothered with going through all that 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 requires. Yeah, it's still a nonprofit, though. It's very important to to make yes. that. Yes, yes, we are we are a nonprofit. Mortuaries, yeah. And yeah. also the fact that you're part of the Funeral Consumers Alliance does that make it you eligible if anybody died uh, outside of San Diego? Exactly. So if you're traveling anywhere in the United States uh, and you have a death, you can contact any of our sister societies. And if you go to a website called funerals.org, funerals.org, right there on the front, you scroll down just a little ways, you'll see a map of the United States. And if you click on the state that you're interested in, you'll see whether or not there's a sister society there. There's not one in every state, so it's not comprehensive. Um, also, if you're traveling in Europe, you're not covered over there. And so sometimes if there's um, someone who's interested and they do travel to Europe a lot and they really want to make sure they're covered no matter what, I suggest they join the Neptune Society because I believe you're covered over, over in Europe. So, uh, what else should I tell you about us? It's 55, it's, sorry, go ahead. I was gonna ask you if you know, what, what you know about green burials. We'll probably talk about that later with our- um, all, What I know about green burials is that Oceanside Mortuary, which is one of our participating mortuaries, they partner with a cemetery down in Joshua Tree. And that, that's the place, the nearest place that I know of for green burial. I don't think there's any in San Diego County yet, but I did talk to somebody the other day and they said some of these cemeteries are offering a, a bottomless um, bot. So, and then the casket can also be set up so that it is bottomless. And then that facilitates the decomposition of the body in the same way that it would at a green cemetery. There's also something coming out that will allow the body to be composted, which sounds really fascinating. And I'm sure at some point will really become much more mainstream. So I was always told if you wanted to compost, you couldn't put any meat in the composter, but they must have come up with something that allows for the body to decompose. So uh, let's just, let me just look over my notes here um, to make sure I've covered everything. Um, the big guess, advantage that's pretty much it. If we open it up for questions, maybe we'll cover yeah. some other territory. So the big advantage of the Memorial Society is first of all, the choices you have, but the fact that it's nonprofit can lower the cost for people. Yes. Yes, that's the primary objective. And you're supporting an organization that goes out and um, talks to different groups about the importance of pre-planning, just like you were mentioning at the beginning here, Faye. If you wait until the last minute, if you're almost inevitably gonna pay too much because your uh, loved ones are a bit shell-shocked at the whole situation and they're scrambling to figure out what to do. They call the first mortuary. 
or the mortuary that they used for grandpa a couple years back. And invariably they will get a quote that is too high. And if you plan ahead, you're gonna save money and there's no reason to pay too much is what we, you know, just offer a simple, dignified and inexpensive way to take care of the body. And that's what we help people do. I have to say, I'm a satisfied customer. I've been a member for years and years, but there's only a one-time fee. Yeah. Of course, the Memorial Society accepts donations, but I've only paid once, have not prepaid for my funeral, may not use it because I'm also using UCSD body donation. <laughs> well, that brings up something else. We used to recommend that people don't prepay at the mortuary because what if they go out of business or you know they move or whatever. But now there is a state law that requires the mortuaries to hold the money in a trust, uh, kind of like a separate bank account. And so if you end up not using that mortuary, uh, your loved ones can seek for a return of that money. So that's so it's okay to pre-plan to to do what they call a pre-need agreement, uh, and that does lock in today's pricing. So that's that's a pretty good way to go. Now the Oceanside Mortuary does not honor the low prices that we've negotiated, and also set it up as a pre-need agreement. You're going to pay their regular prices, but they're still very reasonable mortuary. But that's the only one of our mortuaries that doesn't offer the pre-need at the same price that. They, that we've negotiated the pricing. I think Mara, Mara uh, Jones will talk about her still uh, waters uh, funeral service, which also yeah. is not part yet of the San Diego Memorial Society. Yeah, good, good. I'm looking forward to that. Yeah. So does anybody else have any questions for me? If you think of them, just write them down and we'll come back to Andrea at the end. And I have to say, when my husband died, we used the Memorial Society. It was very satisfactory. So I'm a satisfied customer here and I'm only using it as a backup because of what Aaron will talk about soon and that is UCSD body donation. Mm -hmm. Good. So in fact, um, if nobody has any pressing questions. We can I, I have a question. Okay. Um, if you plan to use US, UCSD, um, then there probably isn't any need to pre-plan cremation. I guess that's a question. Is, is that true? Well, or? yeah, I understand what you're saying. There's There are some cases where once a death occurs, for some reason, uh, there are a couple of different reasons why the body wouldn't be accepted. Okay, if you've got COVID, uh, if the body isn't found for a couple of days. So there's, there's a few factors that might preclude them from taking the body. And so this would be a backup. I would suggest that just let your family know, look, if for some reason I don't get, my body doesn't get taken for the body donation program, please call the San Diego Memorial Society. They'll sign someone up even after death occurs. So you can sign up at the time of need and still get a membership number. And then you give that membership number to the mortuary and they apply the discounts. If you're planning ahead, then I'll send a full membership packet out, which includes your membership card, which you should keep in your wallet. But always the most important thing is talk to your loved ones about what you want done with your body. Somebody's got to handle it. You know, it's it's a task that's got to be taken care of. And waiting till the last minute does not help anybody. And if I'm out of town, but I have a prepaid agreement with the uh, crematorium, um, can they still provide service for me or... Do we do well, something? yes, we do have sister societies all over the United States, but not in every single state. Again, you could check funerals.org. If there, if let's say you've got to Massachusetts every year, you want to make sure you're covered up there. You can check that very state to see if there's somebody there for you. Um, so, yeah, we'll go to go to the rest of the questions. John, John has a hand up for a question. Hi, can you hear me? Yes. Oh, okay. Uh, I. I apologize. I got in a little late here, and um, I just want to know if I'm under your plan. Uh, the memorial, what do you call it? The memorial plan? Yeah, the Memorial Society uh, membership. Okay. Uh, how do I find out? If, I mean, I remember 20, 30 years ago, I, I made a payment, and I was really with a group associated with the Unitarian Universalist Church, and occasionally I get something in the mail, but I don't really look at it. How can I tell if I'm under your program? 
Uh, the best thing to do, John, is to call me. Call me tomorrow. I'll give you the number, and then I'll check the membership roster rather than checking on it right now for you. It'll just take us a minute, okay. and then I can talk to you in more detail. But, John, the number for the Memorial Society is 858-391-1267. And I'm here all day. If I don't answer, just leave a message and I'll call you back within the hour. Well, let me make sure it's 858-391-1267. Yes, sir. That's okay. right. Thank you. Thank okay. You. We okay. have a question from Pat too, wanting to know if you work with funeral agencies in Mexico. <laughs> we leave that up to the particular mortuaries to work out all the logistics if a body has to be taking, taken back to Mexico or brought across the border. That's something that's handled at the mortuary level. We're just the organization, we're just a membership organization that um, partners with these mortuaries. So when the time of death occurs, uh, we don't want people calling us directly. They need to know that they need to call the mortuary directly and maybe even have the number on the refrigerator so that you know, when the time comes, you know what to do and your family knows what to do. And that is to call the mortuary and have them set up all of the, um, all of the things that you're gonna need. I'm sorry to interrupt, but I do think we have to move on to the next speaker. Okay. Save your questions, please, because some of the other speakers may answer them. Uh, Erin Wilcox is our next speaker. It's Dr. Erin Wilcox. She has a PhD from University of Nebraska. And uh, she also earned her degree in mortuary science from Cypress College. And she teaches at several community colleges and she's a licensed embalmer. And Erin is with the uh, UCSD body donation program. Erin, tell us about that. I'm also a member of that, so. Yes, thank you, Faith. Um, yeah, uh, I guess this is a good uh, follow-up for uh, from Andrea. Um, because we kind of talked a little bit about body donation. Um, I was just going to add, um, just to just because she was just talking about that, for sure with body donation, we always recommend that families have a backup plan. Um, in fact, we, we actually suggested in our uh, donor agreement as well, uh, just because you just never know. I mean, unfortunately, none of us can predict, um, you know, when the time comes or, or where we're going to be or what we're going to be doing or the circumstances or anything like that. Um, here at UCSD, we're actually fairly um, lenient as far as body donation programs go. Uh, we have a, a much higher weight limit than all of our sister schools and then many other donor programs. Um, we have a, a bigger death interval, which is the time uh, the time of death to the time that we actually are able to accept the body. Sometimes we can go up to two weeks. It just kind of, again, depends on, it's a case-by-case -case basis. So all of those things were, were fairly lenient, but unfortunately, sometimes there are circumstances where we're unable to accept. And um, I'll get into that. I do have a presentation that I'll go ahead and start because I know we're kind of limited on time here. Um, let me see if I'm able to share my screen. So while Aaron's figuring that out, the advantage of the uh, San Diego Memorial Society is the price. And the advantage of the body donation is that you're able to help other people and uh, help with research at the medical school. Correct. And also the price is pretty good. There is no cost no um, to your family. <laughs> um, and uh, the, the only cost would be death certificates if your family needs those, which most people, of course, do um, eventually. But anyways, so here we go with the presentation. I can figure it out here. <clears throat> like Faye said, I'm Erin Wilcox. Um, some of you, I actually recognize your names. I can't believe my memory. So I think maybe some of you are donors and um, I've maybe talked to you before. Um, so anyways, the anatomical donation program, of course, we're part of the University of California, which is uh, our entire system, um, which technically we're all one. Uh, we have uh, four, there's five total donor programs. We have four sister schools here in, in the UC system. 
Um, so there's one up at UC Davis, UCSF, uh, UCLA, and UC Irvine. So the great part about that is we do cover the whole state of California. Uh, so if you're anywhere else in California, um, our program is actually the biggest. So you probably would end up coming to us anyway, but we do have our sister schools just in case uh, it's a different area or it's um, easier for them. Sometimes they can hold the donor for us until we're able to get up there or over there, wherever. Um, we also currently cover Southern Nevada, which is the Las Vegas area, um, because the University of Nevada at Reno is kind of unable to, they just have a lot smaller program and we have a very robust program. And so we uh, said that we would go ahead and cover that area. So if you're, you happen to be in Las Vegas or also anywhere in Arizona, um, we, can, we can also accept you here at UCSD. Um, so the anatomical donor program was established to support the work of our medical schools and our hospitals. Of course, we train lots of healthcare workers here at UCSD. We have um, our medical students, we have pharmacy students, we're soon to have PA uh, physician assistant program coming in. Um, and then we also support uh, other colleges um, like SDSU has a big nursing program. Um, we support the Navy and their big biomedical, uh, what do they call it? The Bioskills Training Center. Um, lots of community colleges and other colleges in all of California and um, Nevada, Arizona. I think that's New Mexico. Erin, you talking about donating the body to this to these schools for research is that what you mean um the body is donated to us but we they do not have donor programs like sdsu so the nursing students have to be able to um utilize cadavers from you know somewhere so we're able to allocate um cadavers to them it, and they eventually come back here to ucsd um and are cremated which i'll get into in a little bit but yes so we we actually just assist like support their programs um as they're training healthcare professionals as well um, nursing students there's um, paramedics uh all the allied health professions that you can think of so it's just that not a lot of schools have donor programs usually medical schools do um, but anyways, so we're able to support all of those programs as well. And um, let's see, in 2019, there were over 1,500 donations to UC. Um, so you can see that every year there's, there's over 1,000 uh, donations at our locations. Um, here at UCSD, we usually have about 500 a year, which is pretty large. We're the second largest in the U.S. Um, who's able to donate Cal if you're a California resident, if you're over the age of 18 um, and you have the capacity to, to understand and sign the required forms, you can most likely be a body donor. Um, in some cases, uh, like I mentioned, a resident of a neighboring state might be able to register. And um, very rarely we accept minor donors. Um, it, since I've been here eight years, I think we've had maybe two or three, uh, and it was it's just really a case by case basis, but it's not a, a, a usual thing. Um, some limitations, contagious diseases, um, ex some programs might uh, deny donors for extreme emaciation or obesity and some circumstances of death. Like I mentioned here, here at UCSD, uh, very rarely, actually never, I don't think because of extreme emaciation or obesity, um, over 350 pounds, I guess, for obesity, which is pretty high for a donor program. Um, contagious diseases, we do, we aren't able to accept hepatitis B, hepatitis C, HIV, um, and currently COVID, if they have tested positive within the past 28 days, if they've had COVID and recovered, we're, we are able now to accept. Um, I'm assuming that will change at some point. Uh, the hepatitis C, uh, the cure, we're still unable to accept a history of, ep of hepatitis C. Um, but I do tell people to check back because, you know, with advances uh, like the, the cure that's um, currently available for hep C, um, you never know when that might change. But currently we're not, we're still unable to accept with a history of hep C. Um, and then 
really only, only at the time of death can we make that final decision. Um, but generally we don't turn away registered donors. Uh, why do people choose to donate? Of course, there's lots of reasons, but uh, usually reasons that I hear just from talking to donors and donor families, um, you know, maybe they themselves were a healthcare professional, they have some sort of um, affinity for maybe UC or UCSD, uh, maybe they graduated or their kids go here, that sort of thing. Um, but anyways, we get lots of donors for various reasons, um, but maybe just wanting to help out others or, you know, something besides being put into the ground or or just cremated. Besides body donation, are there other other anatomical, I think you're talking about that now, uh -huh. anatomical parts that are used through the body donation program? Uh, not for transplant purposes, but for research, yes. Mm -hmm. uh, the University of California is one of the largest research institution, uh, public research institutions in the country. Uh, so we do use various specimens for um, lots of different re research, uh, including like biomedical research, um, like for um, uh, equipment, biomedical equipment, um, you know, like prosthetic legs, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> That's just an example. But yes, lots of different things besides just a cadaver. So if you wanted uh, to take your, your eyes to the eye bank, what would you do? Yes, that can be done. That would be done before um, donation to UCSD. But we okay. do, we are able to facilitate that. Yes, same with organ donation and tissue donation for transplant purposes. If you would qualify at the time of death, we would be able to facilitate the, the body donation as well. Uh, some of these programs have gotten in trouble for selling body parts. Does that ever mm -hmm. happen? It does not here at UC. That's not to say that it hasn't in the past. Um, that's why we have a lot of the policies and I guess regulations and stuff that we do now. Uh, but, but currently we have a very robust uh, checks and balances system. We have a system-wide director who does audits regularly. Um, we have an outside auditing um, resource. Uh, I actually work part-time as well for the um, the office of the president. So I'm involved in a lot of that stuff. I just recently did an audit at UCLA. So basically we just have to check um, that everything that comes in is cataloged and you know is appropriately allocated and things like that. So uh, yes, there are for-profit uh, donor programs out there that sell body parts that maybe get them somehow illegally or utilize a donation um, illegally. And when I say illegally, it's <laughs> It's really not illegal. It's kind of a gray area. Um, there's really no one who enforces that sort of thing. It really just has to be kind of self-managed. Um, so unfortunately, um, but I would say that um, most educational uh, institutions are pretty safe as far as body donation. Now you get into that gray area when you, when you donate to like a for-profit agency, not that they don't do good things, but um, you know, someone is making a profit from your donation. So I don't want to mention any names, but uh, I've got Science Care, which advertises very widely. Uh, in fact, when you look up yes. the body donation, you get Science Care, which is a for-profit organization. Yes, yes, it is. And then yeah, I, I was trying not to mention I know, any names, but, I, but yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, what happens to your body after the? Uh, students are finished with you? Yes, um, I'm gonna go ahead and skip to that slide. Um, let's see, oh, at the end of the period of use, we will cremate or bio-cremate the body and scatter at sea. Uh, we do include bio-cremate in there because UCLA actually does the alkaline hydrolysis, which is um, maybe you guys have talked about it in your society, but it's kind of like the green cremation is what sometimes people refer it to refer to it as or water cremation um, but anyways UCLA does do that we cremate we have our own crematory um, on campus and we do that in scatter at sea um, we do not return remains um, we do scatter all of our donors at sea we do have um, our new memorial site, and hopefully some of you have had a chance to visit, or maybe you saw the, the story in the paper, but it's absolutely gorgeous. If you do get a chance, it's open to the public. It's on our campus, uh, just north of Scripps Pier. You can see in the bottom picture the pier. Um, so this is kind of where it's at. If you go to our website, you can get a more specific uh, location for that. 
um, but please visit it's it's so pretty um especially around sunset um and it has you can see kind of the rocks there that's the sun lines up there i think it's like at the equinox it's pretty cool uh, i think what most people are worried about is is the body treated respectfully and a lot of us know medical students who don't always talk about their patients respectfully. Oh, no, I'm sorry to hear that. Um, yes, we do have very strict rules in our labs. Uh, all of our labs are uh, restricted access. Um, myself and my three other colleagues have to go through pretty rigorous background checks. Also, we even more so for the Navy. Um, but yeah, it's not just anyone can go in the labs or in anywhere in our area. Um, but we do try to enforce the, you know, the medical and medical students to be very respectful with their, they call them patients. Um, but I'm sure that there are some bad apples, just like everything. Um, but, but yeah, as far as I know, everyone is treated very respectfully. I know there's some very good uh, chat questions. Pam, the time is up there, is locations? Mm -hmm. Yes, okay. uh, and our contact information. Good. Okay, we have introduced the subject of alkaline hydrolysis, and for that we have a special speaker, and that's Mara Jones. Where are you, Mara? I'm here, hello everybody. Good, thank you. And Mara is the owner of Stillwater's Funeral Service, you better correct me on that. Um, and is going to talk about alkaline hydrolysis, although your mortuary does other things, as I understand it. So Mara, tell us about yourself and it. Thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be here. I'm Mara Jones. I'm a guest speaker here today. I'll be speaking a little bit about alkaline hydrolysis mm -hmm. and natural organic reduction. I am the owner and the founder of Stillwater's Funeral Services and Alkaline Hydrolysis. We are the new kids on the block in the funeral industry. We've been around for almost two years. Um, we're very proud to have been able to serve over 50 families already this year um, during this unexpected and rough time. I have a bachelor's degree in mathematics of all things. I know people always ask, how do you go from mathematics to funeral service? Um, in my um, la latter experience too. I have been a medical field worker for 15 years, specifically in the medical laboratory, medical lab technician, and a phlebotomist. I fell in love with hydrolysis uh, back in 2015, and I started following natural organic reduction in 2017. And um, as part of my graduation project, I have just been following this and was determined to bring it to the public as a way to serve them with some new eco-friendly uh, end of life solutions. So that's kind of how Stillwaters came along. Um, I'm gonna be introducing some um, information, hopefully to um, educate everybody and just um, hopefully create interest. And I'm also here to answer all of your questions as well. So we'll be talking more about alkaline hydrolysis. So Stillwater's Funeral Services and Alkaline Hydrolysis. Um, a brief history um, on our funeral home. Um, again, uh, as mentioned before, so we are on a mission to bring the new eco-friendly end of life services to our local community, our state. Um, <clears throat> And we're able to offer the alkaline hydrolysis because it's legal in uh, California. We're going to talk more about that in just a moment. And we're also able to offer the natural organic reduction. I've had to do a lot of working with the state and the Cemetery and Funeral Bureau to make this one happen. So let's just dive into a quick brief history of alkaline hydrolysis. The what is it? The where did it come from? How? Uh, we get so many different questions. Uh, so let's just re, uh, dive in and I hope to, again, educate you all and um, create a lot of interest in this matter. So alkaline hydrolysis is also known as aquamation, water cremation, bio cremation, or aqua cremation. Um, it's um, been the most common disposition choice for pet loved ones currently today. So it's still thriving. Where did it come from? It came from the uh, Amos Herbert Hobson, who was a farmer in England. It's been around since 1888, so it's definitely historic. Um, it's been recognized uh, by the United States 
um, since December 25th, 1888. The uh, big, the big shebang per, like per se is the nitrogen inside the bones. So because of this um, alkaline process, um, Amos definitely knew as a farmer that if he could harvest that nitrogen, he could make suitable fertilizers and byproducts from animal carcasses. Um, that has not changed. That has continued over the centuries to flourish. Our fertilizer industry um, heavily depends on alkaline hydrolysis. So moving forward up into more um, current times, around 1990, Dr. Gordon and Dr. Peter, or Dr. Gordon Kay and Peter Weber, they really needed a way to dispose of radioactive um, isotopes and animals that have been treated with radioactive chemicals. Uh, when they kind of came up with this process per se, they didn't come up with the process, but the process of actually the hydrolysis, they found the gold in the liquid the liquid portion of it where they found that that effluent or the water that comes from the alkaline hydrolysis process is sterile and has actually removed the radioisotopes from the bones of those animals and they could use that as a safe environmental disposition for those animals thus the the more modern tissue digester was uh, born and around that time, the tissue digesters are the, the huge machines. I'm going to show you a picture of it next, but they're able to hold thousands of pounds of animal carcass at a time, like two or three horses, a few sheep, and a bunch of dogs and cats at the same time. So as that flourished and moved forward since 1996, alkaline hydrolysis has treated our animal carcass materials through tissue digestion, or also known as alkaline hydrolysis in the U.S. cattle industry, so a kind of grim example is all of the animals that don't make it to our local supermarkets for our food and dinner are usually treated with alkaline hydrolysis to dispose of, of those animal carcass. Um, and that's been flourishing um, since 1996. It's still used today. With that, again, the pet um, death industry has been flourishing in aquamation. Um, before fire cremation was the main um, disposition of pet loved ones, but that paradigm has changed. A lot of people are desiring the um, alkaline hydrolysis for their pets as well. Um, so a little current, a snapshot of what's going on in our state. Um, really, there was like a 14 year gap where there was just like nothing between like 1996 and 2010. And then out of kind of per se like nowhere, um, 2010, California uh, has an assembly bill, 2283, and they give alkaline hydrolysis a definition. And moving forward um, through 2011, the CFB is, stands for the Cemetery and Funeral Bureau. They adopt the alkaline hydrolysis chamber regulations. They start um, creating laws and other things that we will need in the future. Um, and at the same time, because this is nationwide, this is not just California. So by this time in 2010, 2011, you had three or four states already aquamating people. Um, so the first al alkaline hydrolysis of the United States was performed in a, a licensed funeral home in Columbus, Ohio at the beginning of 2011. And from there, um, in certain states and demographics of the United States, they continued to practice and use alkaline hydrolysis as a legal disposition for humans. Uh, moving forward for our particular state, um, in October of 2017, the Assembly Bill 967, um, alkaline hydrolysis is approved to commence in the state, which means it's uh, going to be legal in the state of California on July 1st, 2020. Um, and it did. So as of today, alkaline hydrolysis is legal as of July 1st, 2020 in the state of California. I think people want so to that's a brief history. Um, I uh, that was like the music to my ears. I've been waiting years for that. Um, it was working all in my favor, per se. I was so excited to be able to serve the community and bring these new trends um, to the local community um, as everything was falling into place with natural organic reduction and hydrolysis. So the next thing that we'll move on is to, I hope nobody has a weak stomach. This is some real life alkaline hydrolysis process. There's really no way to, to other describe it. They're using a pig carcass. Um, 
basically, I like to start at the bottom right hand corner per se and picture six per se. Um, that is a, res a type of resumator machine. This is the bioresponse solutions model. There's a few manufacturers out there. Um, Sandy Sullivan has Resumation, BioResponse, and there's also an um, international aquamation uh, manufacturer that services uh, Canada, France, and the UK and other, uh, other countries as well. So al alkaline hydrolysis is worldwide. It's just not um, per se, uh, we just, we don't really know about it here um, in our local, community in most states there's it's not legal there's not defined and it's not Let's being to find out what happens to you when you get hydrolysized <laughs> what happens yeah so i just give you guys a second to kind of digest what's going on so if we can start per se in the bottom picture this is the bioresponse um model of the resumation machine the body is gently placed inside the middle chamber which is comparable to traditional cremation because that chamber holds up to 500 pounds naturally. Uh, the loved one, we will go back to the top left corner, box one. Um, the alkali part of the hydrolysis is the white powder that you see. So it's basically salts, it's sodium or potassium hydroxide. And by making that environment a little more alkali, what you can do with something that has passed away is you can mimic natural decomposition and you can accelerate the speed of how fast something is decompositioning. And I don't know if anybody's read articles, we don't boil people, we don't dissolve anybody. This is a very gentle, very caring, very compassionate method. So the first step would be the loved one would be laid into the chamber carefully. We would add the alkali. There's a certain formula that you would add according to the weight of the person. We would uh, respectfully close the chamber. You see the chamber is at a certain angle. It just helps with the ergonomic positioning, the body positioning as the process is happening. So it helps that, that part of the dissolution. Box three in the top right corner would be the pig carcass halfway through the hydrolysis process. And you can see the effluent water you can see that um, the pig is naturally, we don't dissolve anybody, but naturally dissolving the decomposition is speeding up. The fourth picture in the bottom right-hand corner would be um, to almost the completion of the process where that, that liquid per se, um, at the funeral home, we try to not call it effluent because it, it is a type of effluent, but at the funeral home per se in our culture, we try not to call it effluent because that is related to something that is flushed down the sewer. And it is more respectful than that. We don't flush anybody down the sewer. So we just call it the liquid portion. And we explain it that it is minerals and I'm sorry, it is peptides and amino acids and sugars and salts. It represents, and it's almost like amniotic fluid per se. Like a lot of people say, oh, I think of that as my loved one being back in the womb of their mother. And it very closely resembles that. So it's very caring and a nurturing process. Once the um, hydrolysis part is completely processed with the liquid portion, that liquid portion, because of the alkali levels and the, the peptides, the salts, the amino acids, it is really good for the environment. And it is welcomed by the sewer systems and the wastewater systems. And once that um, container is drained per se and the, uh, the liquid portion is returned to mother nature, you do have these beautiful angelic-like bones, which is one of the main differences on the outcomes versus fire tradition. These bones are not carbonized. They're not charred. They're not burned in any kind of way. They're actually very spongy and extremely soft to where you can crumble them in your hands. And they're soaked with water at this point. It is a water process. So from here, um, our crematory and our crematory manager, we would dehumidify the bones. Uh, different funeral homes do it different ways. Some use a dehumidification room. Some use a baker's oven. I prefer a baker's oven on very low temp. Um, I, I, I just like the way the consistency that it gives after the bones are dry. And these bones are pure calcium mineral. They're just the pure mineral remains of the bone. And there is 
20 to 30% more. You can see that there. There's nothing been burned off, nothing lost, nothing charred, nothing gone into the air as um, cadaver particle or anything like that. So you do have that 20 to 30% more remains. And once those bones are completely dried out, we do process them just like traditional cremation where we use a bone grinder and we would um, process those remains and return them to the family as ashes. And that is a complete cycle of um, alkaline hydrolysis from start to finish. And it does take, it's um, longer than traditional cremation. It's six to eight hours because this is a, a gentle and a lower temp. It's 300 degrees can be considered high temp depending on how you look at it. But when you're comparing it to traditional cremation whose degrees are in the thousands, um, this is very comparable. And it does take six to eight hours for an average sized person to complete this process. Is what is uh, the fertilizer part? Is it the dried remains or the effluent? The fertilizer part um, comes into two different aspects. It's both. It's the effluent is really good fertilizer itself, and those pure calcium phosphate remains. Those are the remains that people are using for the living urn and to plant in their garden. Um, they're using those um, for that portion as well as fertilizer per se. Now cremation cremains are not used as fertilizer, is that right? You can, you can. They're just a little more carbonized. Um, and uh, honestly, cremains work better if you were, because they have all these cool memorializations, like you can make diamonds out of your ashes. Your, your, your fire cremated ashes would be better because they're heavily carbonized, whereas these ones may not be the best to make a diamond. So you, there, there's always a compare and contrast for both of them. And the cost of uh, doing alkaline hydrolysis? So the cost of for our funeral home is $22.95. And so to make uh, just a quick disclosure that it is not happening in California right now, it is legal, but the state is not ready for it to actually happen right now. So there's a few of us that are on the alkaline hydrolysis bandwagon per se, and all of us offer it um, out of state service. What does that mean? That means um, a practical example would be um, a loved one, we would assume a loved one into our care and protection. We would filing, do all the filing for death certificates and permit. And then we would escort that person or that person would be shipped out um, from, for us, we are, our loved ones go to Washington for the process. So we would escort them to the airport. They would take a quick flight to Washington and be assumed by um, our staff there. The hydrolysis would take place and we would be able to assume the, re the remains of the person back into our custody and care. And the closest locations that it's happening is Las Vegas, Washington, and Utah. So these machines are in your, your place, but they're not used here for California bodies, is that right? The machines um, are not in any, not in my place yet or really anywhere place yet. The state hasn't allowed us a manufacturer the wastewater actually get the wastewater department, the director, he actually gets to pick the manufacturer. That's what we're waiting on for California is we need somebody to tell us what machine we're allowed to use. The fact is the effluent there that you can see is what really the holdup is. The pH of that effluent water is extremely high between 11 and 12. The sewer regulations only accommodate up to about 10.6 per se. Um, so that's why this, it's not being performed here. It's really more of that effluent water regulation that everybody's waiting for. So um, there's another fellow up north who is offering the same service and he drives his loved ones to Las Vegas. To where? Las Vegas. Oh, to Las Vegas. Yes. Okay. And you ship the whole body to Washington before there anything happens to it? That is correct. Wow. <laughs> Um, excuse me, could I just add in, you know how I was talking about UCLA does uh, bio cremation. So they are separate from like funeral homes. Um, you know, they they are legally allowed to do it and they've been doing it for maybe like 15 years. It's been a long time. Um, so just, I just wanted to make sure and clarify that. So no one thought that something. Yeah, and if anybody has family or friends on the East Coast, the Mayo Clinic has the same setup going as UCLA. They're also using water cremation for the last 15 to 20 years as well. Yes. So yep. on, that, on that side of the, the other side of our continent there. Yes, sorry to interrupt tomorrow, but no, yes. No, you're fine, thank you. 
Um, other than that, if I can switch to natural organic reduction really quick. Um, I chose Washington. Again, I've been following natural organic reduction and um, alkaline hydrolysis for quite some time. They are in the same place per se. Um, that's why I chose Washington versus Utah <clears throat> or Las Vegas. Uh, we are committed to um, this green movement per se in the end of life care. Um, and natural organic reduction is also known as NOR. Um, it's also known as human composting, natural human composting or above ground composting. Um, in the summer of 2011, and I have a lot of information on the citation slide that you can go back and look at a lot of this stuff as well. So in the summer of 2011, Recompose founder and CEO, Katrina Spade, first started thinking about the idea uh, that became Recompose. By spring 15, um, the first study was performed on, uh, using a real human body, and it was very successful. Around fall 2017, Recompose was founded. That was around the time right between those two milestones. I started following. Um, Natural organic reduction is legal in the state of Washington since May 2020. Um, their ESB, which is their form of their assembly bills of 5001 was signed by the governor. And um, since February, so moving to California, California and Washington also follow each other legislatively. I don't know if anybody knows that pattern. Uh, we're both very green states. Um, so as they were legalizing February 2021, we have actually been fighting for this since around the same time um, in May. However, it didn't hit the assembly bill till this year. Um, coronavirus last year really put a damper in things. So the state, we have AB 501 now, which introduces human composting in the state of California. Um, it defines it as disposition of reduced human remains by integration into the soil. Um, we were making really good progress this year. Um, AB 501 is actually set to commence, and, and that means become legal um, in July 2023, just a little over a little under two years now, if it's approved. However, um, unfortunately, the state of California, the current status is that it's being held under submission as of August 26, which means they kind of put the meeting on hold. They haven't resumed it since then is pretty much what it means. So we're hopeful, we're following this. We are um, complete supporters of Recompose and natural organic reduction. We're hopeful for this to commence and just kind of go through. We're hopeful to see what next year has with these meetings um, in our legislative. And then we can talk a little more about the process as well. Um, um, this picture is from the Recompose website. Again, you, there's information on the citation page. But this is a, um, basically a snapshot of the process. So for the natural organic reduction, um, there's a lot of unique factors. Uh, the time limit per se is it takes 30 days to transform a human body into soil. That's one unique factor. Um, the process itself, as you can see, includes wood chips, a lot of wood chips, alfalfa, straw, bacteria or microbial activity and heat. And once those are combined in the mixture and the body is placed in burial, we would call it internment, but when the body is placed here, they will introduce the proper heat, the proper temperature, they will aerate over the 30 days to provide the oxygen to just maintain that, um, the to, excuse me, to maintain that, um, process of human uh, composting. And once that is done, the amount of soil is like tremendous. It's like a square yard of soil that comes out of that. And it's top soil, the best top soil that you can ever get. So it's the equivalent where if you were going to the garden store or the nursery and you wanted to plant a garden and you bought a few bags of top soil, this is the equivalent to that. When this process is done, and I just a few things to throw on there, you cannot uh, have a loved one with an embalming. Embalming will disqualify that person from utilizing natural organic reduction as a final disposition. It just interferes with the, my, the microbial activity. And it's embalming is, we don't, you know, it doesn't preserve, but it's, it does the opposite of what this organic reduction is trying to do. 
um, to keep it simple, simply put. Um, and there's a lot of benefits to natural organic reduction. It does reduce carbon emissions dramatically. We definitely have a land um, shortage in our cemeteries. There's so many local cemeteries that are almost full. They're looking to develop and buy more land. So this process um, minimizes the shortage and the demand for cemetery ground. It also prevents a lot of water pollution from all of just the heavy metals and the embalming fluids that we bury. Um, and just everything that goes down our drains during certain processes and end of life care. Um, when the process is done, of course, the family cannot take home a cubic, a square yard of soil, but they do get to have uh, six, 64 ounce jars, like four 64 ounce jars of the top soil. And that would be like the cremated remains. So they still do get something to memorialize them but it is literally topsoil. Um, even the bones and the teeth, uh, so alkaline hydrolysis, the bones of the inorganic materials, and the minerals, they remain, but in this process, the inorganic materials, and the bones and the teeth, they are uh, returned in, to soil as well. So that's another different um, aspect of the two. And um, we have been lucky to send one person so far, we're very proud of that. Um, we are spreading the news, the good news about natural organic reduction. Um, you guys have any other questions um, about natural organic reductions? And the last thing that I'll say is that this process is very natural. It's been here in the United States for many, many decades. We compost our fruits and vegetables. We compost our cattle. Um, as I know as a student, there was like so many composting farms around campus, like everywhere you go, there's like food composting or some kind of or sustainable farm or organic farms. So it's something that's just been around forever. It's totally natural. And um, the another good thing about the environment too is that you can also donate that soil to a forest or any other organizations that are into restoring the earth or replanting or, um, um, just any of that kind of uh, land restoration, all that topsoil can be donated as well. What's the cost for composting? The cost, uh, don't quote me on the website. I believe it's $5,500 for a full service or recompose, but that is the local cost. Um, we're very supportive of their mission and all of the great things that Katrina has done. So um, within our package, we are able, our package does not include their cost. It's basically um, the shipping costs and the care costs to be able to get that person out of state um, to be able to get that desired disposition. But their cost itself is 5,500. Ours here in California to get there is 22.95. So you pay your cost and their cost, is that right? That would be correct. Wow, so that's expensive. To make yourself it is fairly expensive until until the legalities work out of it all it will be a little more expensive just because we work a lot with the cemetery and funeral bureaus along the state of, with california to be able to offer these out-of-state services and do it legally for the families and unfortunately right now it does require a lot of um, shipping um, and that's where it kind of can get expensive with flight costs um, and just combo kits and things like that you need to properly and respectfully um, ship the, a loved one across state lines. And the advantage over cremation is the uh, cost to the environment, I'm assuming. That is correct. And um, one's personal beliefs and perspectives. For example, we had a case come in on Friday and she said, look, my mom was a 90 and we are, we're, that was kind of like the last of our generation per se. We all want to move. She was terrified of fire and she doesn't want to be buried. Um, what do we got to do to make this happen? Uh, we also get a lot of other people that just desire the first thing that you said, a more eco-friendly uh, way of death per se. They want to give back to the earth or they just, frankly, they don't want to be burned. Be quite frank about it. And they don't want to be buried. Um, and most people can't afford burial in, in my local community. So um, this offers many other benefits than just the environment as well. You, your uh, mortuary does traditional burials too, doesn't it? 
That is correct. We'll first start full service, traditional and modern. Right. And so compared to traditional burial or cremation, how does the cost change differ? The hydrolysis and the natural organic reduction is significantly uh, significantly more. Our direct cremation for a traditional cremation is $9.95 and the direct cremation for hydrolysis is $22.95. Um, again, those will go down once the local services are legally offered here, like in-house and state, that'll drop down dramatically. I, I mean, just to give you an example of part of the cost of flight from San Diego International to SeaTac, which is Seattle, Washington is almost $600 and it's gone up because gas prices. So once California kind of allows it to be full service here in the state per se, um, though the cost will go down dramatically. It will be comparable to traditional cremation then. Aaron, does the uh, body donation program use these more traditional means to dispose of the body? I mean, non-traditional, or is it always cremation? At UCSD, we do cremation. Um, the only, and same with our uh, sister schools, except for UCLA, who has the bio cremation. They have their own machine mm -hmm. at UCLA um, that they use. It's and I don't know if it'll change going forward, you know, in, in the coming years. Uh, but currently, all four other schools do cremation. That's when you right. say bio cremation, are you talking about one of the methods that Mara just talked about? Alkaline hydrolysis. Wow. It's another name for alkaline hydrolysis. Mm -hmm. So if your body is being used at UCLA, you can choose to do alkaline hydrolysis with everything? There's no choice. It's, it is alkaline it is. hydrolysis. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so, and then at UCSD, it's the same. There's no choice that it is cremation. That's correct. Right. So, but at, at UCLA, you have to ship the body again to Washington? No, no. they okay. have their own machine. Uh, you, uh, so I noticed that somebody asked about that. Why is, or they said UCSD, but why is UCLA allowed to do it and not funeral homes? Well, UCLA is not a funeral home. So I'm assuming that it's considered like biohazard. Um, you know, hospitals are allowed to use that just like hospitals are allowed to cremate lots of things at once. Um, you know, if it's not... Uh, it's kind of, I guess, hard to explain. Maybe Mara can explain it better, but it's a little bit different, um, like specimens being cremated compared to like human, a human body being cremated or bio cremated. Um, so is the pH affluent different? Probably not, but it's just a different, um, I guess, qualification or whatever. Yeah, that's basically what it is. So back in the 1990s, when the two doctors kind of came together and they bore that whole resumation um, process and machines, and it's kind of been used in the food and cattle and research industry, that's kind of where it's been, stay, been staying and uh, been regulated. Now for the funeral home is regulated by the Cemetery and Funeral Bureau. And on the part for human disposition, um, there's again, it's all like, what's in the name? There's no definition, there's no law, there's no regulations, there's no process, there's no manufacturer for human disposition. So that's why it's so different um, with the, the schools and the research programs because they're regulated by two different entities. Although they may be um, some way it, like indirectly integrated or using with, you know, like they have their own cre crematory which may require them to have certain requirements as, as my crematory manager, but my business is regulated by the Cemetery and Funeral Bureau, not by any kind of entity that regulates um, education or school or research or science or anything. That's the main difference. And like on the death certificate, the which is you know a legal document, the, there is no form of disposition called you know alkaline hydrolysis or bio. There is now. They've updated it. There okay. is now. Okay, mm -hmm. yeah. So like for us, our method of disposition is scientific use. There's, it's not cremation, it's not alkaline hydrolysis, it's scientific use. So that's the actual final disposition, um, as opposed to like at a funeral home, uh, it would be burial, cremation, now alkaline hydrolysis, um, or I don't know what they call it on the death certificate, but. Uh, in California, it's alkaline hydrolysis, and then they would re-permit it in the state of Washington, and Washington calls it a, a water bath. 
So, uh, and yes. are you still here, Andrea? Yes, I was. Uh, and does the Memorial Society do anything with these methods, these new methods? Well, we were going to have uh, Mara's group come on, and then we thought maybe we'll wait until it's totally ready to go down here in California before we offer it. Uh, one question that I have for Mara is how much water does it use? And is that part of the issue with getting it into California? No, it actually uses less water than your average household would use in a day. Um, and it's regulated the same as well. Um, the water is not an issue typically, depending if you have like a high temp machine or a low temp machine, the sizes will vary, but the average um, tank per se is about 90 gallons of water. Uh, so, so is that the amount, is that the amount of water that's used is 90 gallons or that's how much the tank holds? Typically about that's how much of uh, both. You could say that the tank pretty much holds about 90 to 100 gallons of water and throughout the cycles, depending on, um, again, taking into consideration some variables, how big is this person, um, things like that, plus the water to alkaline ratio, as long as it's 90% water, um, usually, so again, about 90 to 100 gallons of water through each one of those cycles uh, throughout the process. So there's a filling cycles? cycle, there's also a rent cycle. So uh, during each one of those cycles, about 90 to 100 gallons of water. And how many cycles are there? Depending on the manufacturer of the machine, there will be two to three, because there's usually there's a, the, the dissolution cycle, there's usually a rent cycle, and then there's um, usually a cool, like some kind of cooling cycle. Um, so depending on the manufacturer, between two and three, okay. typically. Thanks, Mara. That still would. I think the presentation wouldn't be complete without a little bit about cryonics. Ken, can you show those? It's a four-minute little YouTube on uh, freezing yourself. Near the hot desert, just outside of Phoenix, Arizona, is a company called Alcor. Despite the high temperature outside, within over 100 human bodies are being preserved at very low temperatures. Host David Pogue met with the president and CEO, Max Moore, to learn about the field of cryonics. So who's in this gallery here? These are some of our patients. We call them patients because we don't regard them as dead people. Their idea is that what we call death today is something of an arbitrary line. Really, it's today's doctors giving up and saying, there's nothing more I can do for this person, and I'm letting them go. What we're doing is we're saying, let's not quit there. Let's give the future a chance to bring these patients back. Moore doesn't promise he'll be able to bring any of his patients back, but he thinks the chances are pretty good. Already we're seeing the field of regenerative medicine just burgeoning. Uh, we're already starting to replace organs and grow organ parts. And I think within the next 20 years, you're going to see some amazing developments. So pretty much any organ in the body will be replaceable, either with a biological one grown from your own tissue or perhaps a synthetic organ. After an Alcor member is declared legally dead, the patient is immediately placed in an ice bath. Then, the Alcor team restores respiration to make sure oxygen continues to flow to the brain until the body is cryopreserved. In fact, certain patients choose to preserve their heads alone. Ted Williams, the baseball star, is a famous Alcor neuropatient. But here's the part I don't get. Suppose medical science does advance as you hope, and in 75 years they can revive this decapitated head. You don't have a body anymore. Well, this is the way I look at it. I personally am a neuro member myself. I'm not taking along my body. My reasoning being that by the time I need this, my body's going to be a disaster area. So in my view, if you have the technology that can repair 100 billion damaged neurons, replacing this part is going to be pretty easy by comparison. <laughs> but we leave that choice to our members. So let me show you the patient care bay. Patient care bay. Yes, this is where we have currently 117 patients, the oldest being Professor James Bedford, who's career preserved back in 1967. Wow! Oh my gosh, this so, is very sci-fi. It's not quite as sci-fi as in the movies where they always have a little frosty face behind a glass plate. You can't, <laughs> can't really do that, but here uh, in these larger jewelers we have uh, four whole body patients and we can also fit five neuro patients in the central column. There's, there's people in those cans. That's right. The bodies are wrapped 
in a sleeping bag to protect the skin from direct exposure to liquid nitrogen. Each one is held in its own aluminum compartment within the can. So if we could see through these, we would see people just kind of like floating like this or? Uh, you'd see the, the aluminum pods and inside they're actually head, head down. So that Head the, down? Yeah, so that the, uh, the head would be the last thing to be exposed. So are these heavily insulated? Are these basically giant thermoses? Exactly. Just room temperature, a little bit cool to the touch. Yep. That's the not... inside is extremely cold, minus 196 C, minus 320 Fahrenheit. I mean, you must get some strong reactions from people. You tell them what you do. Especially when they don't really understand it. They, they think there's some kind of strange, creepy thing where you're freezing people. Why would you do that? But once they understand that really it's an extension of critical care medicine, it's just us picking up at the point where today's medicine gives up on people, it makes a lot more sense. When they see patients in hospitals being taken down 10 degrees C to slow down metabolism while you do brain surgery, it starts to make sense. When they look at the research into organ cryopreservation, the goal being to actually build an organ bank and you know, keep a stock of organs rather than having to match one across the country very rapidly, it starts to make sense. It's certainly speculative, it's certainly not guaranteed, we're not sure if it's going to work, but it's not crazy, it's a shot, it gives you a chance. And as for Max Moore? You would live forever. I don't use the word forever because forever is a very long time. Uh, there may be the heat death of the universe, our sun might explode in a few billion years, who knows? But indefinite lifespan I'm talking about. Really changing death from being compulsory to making it an option. So you know, check back with me in a thousand years and ask me if I've had enough. Till then, more will be at Alcor. Well, at least his head will. Well, again, thank you everybody for coming and I really appreciate the discussion. Thank you very much, Aaron and Andrea and Mara for your very excellent informative presentations. And because hemlock is a non-traditional way of dying, I think it's very appropriate for us to know non-traditional ways of getting rid of your body. So <laughs> thank you very much.